Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is entitled, it has a long title, Making Friends for God, The Joy of Sharing in His Mission. And this is lesson number three in that series for July 18 of 2020, entitled, Seeing People Through Jesus' Eyes. Hmm. Eye transplant, some kind of eye transplant, huh? Let's see how this works out. We hope that you will enjoy it as much as we have, but we, as always, we'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have gathered this evening to talk about you, to think about you, to guide and direct um, the thinking of those who might be looking in as to how we might take on the attitudes that you had when you were here on this earth. May we learn from these experiences is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The very name Christian means to be Christ-like. Are we truly seeking to be like Jesus? Think of the ways Jesus preached, reached out to people of all classes to win them for the gospel. Are we doing that? There is not one who does not need God. Wherever he went, Jesus saw souls in need of the truth. Are we able to see that? Of course, Jesus had supernatural um, insight that he received probably every night as he was directed by his Father and the Holy Spirit to approach the right people with the right message. Would they do that for us? How's that for a thought? How can we know if God is guiding us to witness to someone that we have come to know? Jim, Mark 8. Mark 8, 22 to 26. They came to Bethsaida, where some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. After spitting on the man's eyes, Jesus placed his hand on him and asked him, Can you see anything? The man looked up and said, yes, I can see people, but they look like trees walking, among, about, walking about. Jesus again placed his hands on the man's eyes. This time the man looked intently. His eyes returned, his, excuse me, his eyesight returned and he saw everything clearly. Jesus then sent him home with the order, don't go back into the village. That's from American Bible Society. Yeah. Well, there are several things we need to notice about this story. This blind man's friends brought him to Jesus and begged Jesus to touch him. The friends had faith in Jesus. We know nothing about the blind man's faith himself, but we do know about the faith of those who brought him to Jesus. By exercising our faith, could we bring others to Jesus? Well, there's a bit of a problem. We can't bring people to Jesus like they did physically in his day. But uh, could we invite them to a Bible study? Could we invite them to our Sabbath school class? Could we invite them to study the Bible with us? Or should we just be friendly? That's a, probably an excellent place to start. Do people like us and want to be around us? If not, it would be hard for us to attract them to the gospel. Well, if you study the gospels carefully, you'll realize that there are 25 or more miracles of healing performed by Jesus that are recorded in the gospels. This is the only time when he took two steps to complete the healing. Why do you think Jesus did it that way at the, on this occasion? We know nothing about the relationship between this blind man's friends and the blind man himself. Clearly they wanted him to be healed and they made an urgent appeal to Jesus just to touch him. Are we afraid to invite someone to learn about Jesus? If so, what is, what is the reason? Are we worried about what people might think about us or are we worried what, what people might think about him? After his two-part healing, why did Jesus tell this man not to go back into the village? Okay. Have to go and get cleared by the priests. Maybe. We don't know. It doesn't say that for sure. Yeah. 
More than once, Jesus told the people who had been healed not to tell anyone. One reason for this is that in case of leprosy, for example, the person healed was required to go back to the priest and to be declared clean before he could return to his home. If word had reached those priests, priests that Jesus had been the one who healed him, they might have given a false report in order to try to discredit Jesus. So that's one possibility. On other occasions, Jesus was so beset by people wanting to be healed that it was hard for him to talk about the gospel. And this is one of the things that I think we don't emphasize nearly enough. We don't, we don't begin to comprehend. And part of it's probably because we're not really familiar with the geography. But look at these verses from Mark 3, 7 and 8. Carrie? Jesus and his disciples went away to Lake Galilee, and the large crowd followed him. They had come from Galilee, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from the territory of Idumea, from the territory on the east side of the Jordan, and from the region round the cities of Tyre and Sidon. All these people came to Jesus because they had heard of the things he was doing. And that's from the Good News Bible. Wow. That's not a short distance, is that it? Is, Tyre and Sidon. No. We're talking about a 200-mile stretch maybe even more than 200 miles, people had come because they heard what Jesus was doing and they wanted to know. I mean, it was the, it was the craziest thing. I mean, it was the most exciting thing going on in the whole area. There was no question about that. Well, people were coming from all the countries around. These, these are not just Jews. These are not just people from Galilee, not just people from Judea, because they heard what Jesus was doing and they heard about his miraculous healings. If he had allowed himself to be distracted by such people wanting healing, he would, not have been, he would not have accomplished anything else. Do you think the devil had anything to do with all those people crowding in, trying to take up his time? Could be. It's one of those awkward situations. You can yeah. look at it two or three ways. Yeah. Always when healing someone, Jesus sought to point them to the truth and win them for the gospel. That was his main goal. For those of us who are physicians, nurses, or other healthcare professionals, do we try to heal people, not only physically, but also spiritually? Uh, how long do we want them to live? A few more years, or for the rest of eternity? I've been tempted sometimes to ask some of the people I work with who are bilingual, and you have to have bilingual people in the place where I work, and so many of them are, are not Adventists. I've um, been tempted to ask him, okay, we're gonna help this person today and maybe we're gonna save his life. And I have a lot of people that I take care of on a regular basis that probably would have been dead, dead 10 or 15 years earlier if we hadn't taken care of them. So now we've added 10 or 15 years to their life. What would it be like if we added a million years? A billion years? Don't you think that would be great? Hmm. Well, how often do we, see, do we not see people for what they really are? Do we sometimes see people like trees walking? Remember the story yeah. Jim helped us with? Not recognizing their need of God and the potential that they could be even for God's work? Probably the most successful evangelistic team that we know about in the Bible was the team of Paul and Dr. Luke. He probably should have said Dr. Paul because he in our terms, would have had a P, probably a couple of PhDs. PhDs yeah. A minister and a doctor working together. I can remember on one occasion, I personally had the privilege of working with a minister and doctor team in a small church in the state of Maryland in the United States. And they, we, us, we saw absolutely incredible results. In a short time, the membership of that, membership of that church almost doubled. I mean, we're talking nine months. Are we taking the necessary steps to make it possible for doctors and ministers to work together for the success of the gospel? Charles, I think you have some pretty incredible words for us. I have been surprised. This is Ellen White speaking. This is Ellen White speaking. I've been surprised at being asked by physicians if I did not think it would be more pleasing to God for them to give up their medical practice and enter ministry. I am prepared to answer such an inquiry. inquiry. If you are a Christian, 
and a competent physician, you are qualified to do tenfold more good as a missionary for God than if you were to go forth merely as a preacher of the word. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we seem to have been catching up with that fairly recently, don't we? Took a long time to, to figure it out. Yeah. I hope we're, we're doing better. Ellen White has also said soon there will be no other work except medical missionary, medical missionary work. work. Yeah. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yes, I would advise young men and women to give heed to this manner. Perilous times are before us. The whole world will be involved in perplexity and distress. Disease of every kind will be upon us, will be upon the human family. And such ignorance as now prevails concerning the laws of health would result in great suffering and loss of many lives that might be saved. Ellen White, Councils on Health, page 503. Paragraph 3, I am deeply interested in the subject of medical missionary work and the education of men and women for that work. I could wish that there were 100 nurses in training where there is one. Mm. Huh. I ought to be, it yeah. ought to be thus. Both men and women can do so much more useful and medical missionaries than as missionaries without the medical education. Ha ha. Ellen G. White, The Medical Missionary, December 1, 1892, paragraph 1. Well, why did Ellen White make these statements? What advantage do healthcare workers have in bringing people to Jesus? Every day, healthcare workers have people come to them who are, in need, who are in need and asking for help. What, a, what an opening yeah. opportunity. That is a perfect time to help them in the best ways we can and then bring them to Jesus. How was it that Jesus was able to see people not for what they were, but for what they might become? Could we somehow gain that kind of insight? An excellent example from the Bible is found in John 4, 3 to 34, and we don't have time to read that whole section, but that's the story of Jesus at the well of Sychar uh, in Samaria, the time they, he traveled through there with his disciples. And you remember he sat down next to the well, and here was this woman who came by herself, nobody else there to draw water, and he had that discussion with her. Well, in order to understand what was going on in this story, we need to notice some important background information. And here's a statement from the Archaeological Study Bible. It helps to make this interesting observation about, it makes this interesting observation about the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. The rift between the Samaritans and the Judeans dates from an early period. According to 2 Kings 17, and if you want to read something that'll just make you cringe, read 2 Kings 17. What those people were doing before, just before their nation was overrun by the Assyrians. The Samaritans were the descendants of Mesopotamian peoples who were forcibly settled in the lands of, the north, of northern Israel by the king of Assyria in the wake of the exile of 722 BC. They combined the worship of Yahweh with idolatrous practices. So here we have a group of people, they're They've now inhabited, they've been placed there, forced to move there in the, to what used to be the northern kingdom of Israel and mix their heathen religion with mm. true religion. And, you know, that's just about the worst thing you can possibly do. Later, the Jews returning from Babylonian captivity, re, re, captivity refused to allow the Samaritans to join them in rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. Of course, if they had allowed them to join them in temple building, what do you think would have happened? Um, <laughs> admixture. <laughs> yes, exactly. You can read all about that, especially in Ezra 4, first four verses, then Nehemiah 2 and 4. Oh, they had to give up their foreign wives and children. This was serious business. Yeah. Even later, the Jews went to war with the Samaritans and destroyed their temple on Mount Gerizim. And for those of you who have the, uh, have the privilege or have decided to get on the internet and, and download our, our handout, you will see there a great uh, actual um, YouTube, basically, video 
of what the top of Mount Gerizim looked like now. And you can see a Christian church was built there, and then a mosque was built there, and so you see different things piled up there. But you can see the place where the original uh, temple was and where it was destroyed. The most direct route from Jerusalem to Nazareth, or any part of Galilee, was directly through, that's uh, right, directly through the middle of Samaria. But the Jews did not like to travel that way because of the animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. Thus, they usually traveled down to Jericho, crossed the Jordan River, traveled up on the east side of the Jordan River until they could cross the Jordan River again near the southern end of the Sea of Galilee and then into Jewish or Galilean territory. But Jesus saw someone in need in Samaria, and he went there to reach out to her. Uh, how do you suppose he did? Because that's not the way he usually traveled. He usually traveled the way the Jews went. But this time he went through the middle of Samaria. Why do you suppose he did that? <coughs> that's where they went, the woman at the well, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm, head of I'm sure the father showed him there's something to be done over there that you need to go and do. He was hoping to break down the huge walls of prejudice between Jews and Samaritans. In the middle of a hot day, Jesus sat down near a deep well and asked a woman if he could have a drink. In the Middle East, in ancient times, and even in modern times, it is considered to be an offense against God not to give someone water under such circumstances. And what a conversation Jesus had with that woman. He may have told her something that he had not yet even explained to his disciples. And what was that? She said to him, we know that someday a Messiah is coming He's to the coming. Jews. Right, right. And Jesus said, you're speaking with him. You're speaking with him. Yeah. Amazing. How many other times did Jesus reveal to people directly that he was the Messiah? He good. sort of hinted like that to Nicodemus. Yes, he did. Yeah. In John 3. And then in John 8, things were getting really bad. He way? said to the Sanhedrin three times, I am he. I am. I am. I am. Before Abraham was, I am, and they took up stones to, to throw at him to kill him. That's Yahweh. Yahweh. That's Yahweh. Yeah. Well, when he returned to Galilee and told the people in his hometown, even indirectly, by quoting from Isaiah that he was the Messiah, they tried to take him out and stone him. Luke 4, 16 to 30. Incredible. When Jesus had finished talking to the woman at the well at Sychar, his disciples returned and were, and I have to stop for a second and tell you, I had the privilege many years ago to travel to the well at Sychar and travel down there and drink some water out of that very well. So I thought it was a very great privilege. His disciples returned and were surprised to see him talking to her. When the disciples questioned Jesus about what he had been doing, he said something strange. The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few, Matthew 9, 37. Why would he say something like that? Well, I don't think they were quite prepared themselves. <laughs> they were not prepared. By reaching out to this Samaritan woman, Jesus was able to witness to an entire village. Are we willing to be used by God to reach out to those around us? In response to the rejection by the Jews, the Samaritans had established their own priestly line and temple on Mount Gerizim. They mixed heathen practices with the Jewish religion, but all of that did not really matter to Jesus. He saw souls who needed God. How do we get that kind of eyesight? He saw souls who needed Jesus. And what lesson was Jesus trying to teach his disciples through that experience? Yeah. Well, those who have the spirit of Christ will see all men through the eyes of divine compassion. No matter what may be the social position, no matter what is what his wealth or how high his education, if a man is in Christ, he will not be unkind, uncourteous, hard-hearted, and merciless. 
Since every soul is entirely dependent upon God for every blessing he enjoys, how patient, how merciful we should be we should be to every creature. God looked upon man in his lost condition, in his degradation and guilt, and paid the same price for the ransom of the poor and the outcast as he paid to ransom the rich and all his entrusted talents, with all of his entrusted talents. There is no respect of persons with God. All the candidates for heaven or hell all need to be caught, taught every hour of God to be diligent students that in their time they may make a wise use of their entrusted ability, that they may be living agencies in co to cooperate with the heavenly intelligences for the saving of men's souls, that with tender hearts, overflowing with mercy and true goodness, they may work as Christ worked. The apostle says, we are laborers together with God. You are to look after the poor, you are to look after the fatherless ones, and excuse me, who need your wisdom, your care, your love and help. You are to look after the widow. You are to look after those who go in, go in want, in hunger, in rags, who are depraved in principle. For Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. God cares for the outcast. And do you think yourselves too good, too honorable, to bear the yoke with Christ in seeking to save the perishing? I'm going to well, interrupt there for a second. <clears throat> You're too good to bear the yoke with Christ. Christ wants to stand next to you mm -hmm. in the yoke. And no, I'm, I'm too good to stand next to him, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, Jim. Okay. Will you despise? Will you despise your fellow men? Will you become an offense to God by slighting and despising his image in man? In distinct lines, Christ has revealed the relation of man to his fellow man. Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, has settled that question forever in the example he has set to the world. Ask yourself, am I my brother's keeper? And who is my neighbor? Ellen White, Signs of the Time, June 20, 1892. Yeah, she was raising that question at times when she was just starting her work in Australia. And there was a lot of, I mean, they were out there. Just this last week, I was listening to some of the letters she wrote to people at that point in time. They were out there slashing and bur slashing down the weeds and, and the trees and burning, opening up place where she could actually build her own house. It's amazing. And all, all that she talks about what was happening there. So this was shortly after 1888 um, yeah. that, that she yep. went to Australia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there people around you that consciously or unconsciously look down on, that you are consciously or unconsciously look down on and you are not willing to make an effort to win them for Christ for some reason? Could we come to have the same attitude toward those people as Jesus had toward the Samaritans? In our efforts to try to reach out to others, one thing we must recognize is that the place where we must start is wherever we are. There is no other place to begin. You can't start somewhere where you're not. You have to start where you are. It is very easy to think that the job of building up the church is the work of the pastor. After all, he, he gets paid to do that, right? But God has very different plan for his church. He wants everyone to be witnesses for him. What would happen if everyone in the church decided to do that? Hmm. Can you identify times when God has opened the door for you to witness? Did you take advantage of those opportunities? If not, why not? Should we expect every sinner to welcome the opportunity to learn about Jesus? The devil is not going to be happy with that at all. Certainly they do not. If we try to witness to people, could we cause barriers to be erected between us and them? Hmm. That's how you go about it. Yeah. Carrie, I think you have some words from, about that whole thing. Yes. I'm reading from John 1, verses 40 through 41. One of them was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. At once he found his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah 
And it's got in brackets, this word means Christ from the Good News Bible. Okay, just to, for, for those who may not realize, the word Messiah is Hebrew for the anointed one. Uh, a, a, a person who was anointed to be king is a Messiah. Uh, on the other hand, the, word, the same word in Greek is Christ. So Messiah and Christ are the same word, just in different languages. Okay? Yeah. That's why sometimes they say the Christ. Christ. Which it really is the same thing. Yeah. Rather, Christ was not Jesus' name. He was Je Yeshua or Ye Jesus or Joshua, the anointed one. Yeah, exactly. Continuing, I'm reading from John 6, 5 to 11. Jesus looked round and saw that a large crowd was coming to him. So he asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? <laughs> He said, and it's in brackets, he said this to test Philip. Actually, he already knew what he would do. Now, the, the, the parentheses there, that's in the Bible. Don't, don't think I added that. Philip answered, for everyone to have even a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough bread. Now, I'm going to interrupt again. How much is a silver coin worth? That was a day's wages for an ordinary working man. So that's a year's salary. Yeah, yeah. He's talking about. Another of his disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, said, there is a boy here who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish, but they will certainly not be enough for all these people. Ha, you think so? <laughs> Make the people sit down, Jesus told them. And in brackets it's got, there was a lot of grass there. So all the people sat down. There were about 5,000 men. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God, and distributed it to the people who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish, and they all had as much as they wanted. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to imagine, my, when I think this, I, I love this story. Yeah. I mean, the adults, you know, were probably controlled themselves, but the kids must have said, how does he do that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, he, the little boy who gave his lunch, he said, what, oh, what, <laughs> what happened to my lunch? <laughs> yeah. I bet he, all his life he told the story. Yeah, he All absolutely. his life. I was the boy. Who I was the lunch. boy. There's a, there's a way, a story told about this, and of course it's expanded a little bit, but you can imagine, mom probably sent him off in the morning, said, Jesus is going to be down there. If you want to go down there, I'm sure it's going to be safe for you. There will be a lot of other people there. And here's, a, here's some lunch, a small lunch for you to take. We're talking about these aren't, these aren't big loaves of bread. These are, these are little rolls. Yeah. Couple, barley bread. Two, and probably very simple. It might have even been barley bread. Yeah. And who knows, maybe two or three small fish. Yeah. And you could see him, you know, all, all day long. He's like, I, I should eat my lunch. Oh, but Jesus is saying so many interesting things. I'll listen for a while longer. Oh, I should be eating this lunch. Oh, but he's saying so much interesting. I, I, I better wait. <laughs> you, just, you can imagine how that went. All of a sudden, oh, son, could, could we have your lunch? You did your right, right. <laughs> oh, I forgot to eat <laughs> my lunch. <laughs> I just... And you know, life in our worship in heaven is not going to be boring. No. The kid is going to tell his story. <laughs> He's going to tell his story. Be, his you story is going to be told. Right. Okay. I want to, I want to take a quick minute. Um, the Quran mentions Christ as Messiah mm -hmm. more than one place. Yeah. In more than chapter 4, chapter 66, very plainly, Jesus is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Continuing from... You, uh, up to John 12, 20 through 26. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. They went to Philip, and in brackets it says he was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. And I have to interrupt there for just a moment. This may be, it's the only recorded, let's put it this way, this is the only recorded place in the Bible where the man we call Jesus was called something like Jesus. The, the Greek in here is Thelemon Blepain Jesus. So, Jesus, I'm sorry, in the accusative. So, Thelemon Blepain Jesus, and they were Greek, so we're presuming they spoke Greek, and that would be the way it's recorded in Matthew. So, this would be the only place in the entire 
New Testament where he, because his name was Yeshua, right? Yes. Joshua, Joshua, yeah. and not Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I'm telling you the truth, the grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Whosoever wants to serve me must follow me so that my servant will be with me where I am. And my father will honor anyone who serves me. That comes from the Good News Bible. So what do we see here? There are three stories here where Andrew, he, he doesn't stand out, he just assists. Yeah. Oh, you, something needs to be done? We, we heard that there's, and, and try to imagine in the case of that first story, you know, imagine, you know, you get here and you, you hear that here, here's the Messiah. The country, the Jews have been waiting 400 years. In fact, a lot more than that. Yes. They've been a, really 1,400 years since they were told by Moses that someone was coming. But 400 years since the last prophet. And now here's more than 400 years. And here's this guy, and, and we believe. the. So Andrew is rushing to his brother and says, guess what? <laughs> the Messiah is here. I mean, imagine carrying a message like that. What would you have done if you had just discovered that the Messiah had come? Try to imagine yourself in that position. Andrew could not wait to tell his brother, Peter. Later, Andrew brought the little boy with his lunch to Jesus. Still later, Andrew brought some Greeks to Jesus. He knew what to do. What did he do? Bring them to Jesus. Are, are our eyes open to seeing the spiritual needs of those around us? Do those peer, people who see, see something in us that attracts them? Are we compassionate and caring? Do they see in us a peace and a purpose in li living? Are our lives an advertisement for the gospel? Sometimes we see beggars or other homeless people doing things which, with which we are very uncomfortable. I mean, that's... We have to understand that that's true. Do we quietly despise those people? Or do we recognize them as potential members of the family of God? Okay, Charles? It's 34, I think, right? Yeah. Okay. To Jesus... Oh, it's... it's it, there's one just above oh, that. Oh, just above, right. None have fallen so low. None are so vile but that they can find deliverance in Christ. Ellen G. White, Desire of Ages, page 258, paragraph 6. Okay. So under very different, and, and there's passages that if you have your, your handout, you could read Matthew 4, and Mark 12, and Luke 23. Under very different, very, very different circumstances, whenever he saw an opportunity, Jesus tried to reach out to people. Look at these very interesting comments about the thief on the cross, for example. Okay. To Jesus, in his agony on the cross, there came one gleam of comfort. It was the prayer of the penitent thief. Both the men who were crucified with Jesus had at first railed upon him, and one under his suffering only became more desperate and defiant, but not so with his companion. This man was not a hardened criminal. He had been led astray by evil associations, but he was less guilty than many of those who stood beside the cross, riling the Savior. He had seen and heard Jesus and had been convicted by his teaching, but he had been turned away from him by the priests and rulers. I, let me interrupt sure. there for a second. I'm sorry. Here's a man, and, and think of the whole Jewish nation. We have to sympathize with them a certain amount. All of their lives, from the time they were young kids, they have been taught to think in a certain way. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to help, help us beat the Romans. We're going to rule the world, da-da-da-da, all this kind of stuff. 
they had been taught this from childhood. Right. You know, and so this man comes and he, 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 he hears Jesus and he listens to him and he hears Jesus and he said, man, this guy has really got something. But could our leaders be, have been wrong all these years? That, that's impossible. I mean, they, these are the saints, right? They, that was the, that, I mean, they, were, they certainly taught that they were the saints. I mean, they acted like they were the most pious people around. And so finally he was led to think, well, you know, this guy must not be what he, th what he says he yeah, is. Well, he, the, the people came to him for miracles. They came because he fed. Yeah. But see, the, the leaders also said, nah, he could not be. Look, he has no degrees. He has no, no address. Yeah. The man doesn't even know who his father is. So yes, many people, really, it was hard he for He knows them. who his father is. Yes, of course. They didn't know they did who not his know. father there was. There he was. But they said that he yeah. did not know who his yeah. father was. You see, so yes, it was tough. All right, seeking to stifle conviction, he had plunged deeper and deeper into sin until he was arrested, tried as a human criminal and condemned to die on the cross. In the judgment hall and on the way to, the Calvary, to Calvary, he had been in company with Jesus. That must have been, yeah. wow. Didn't realize that he was in the, yeah. okay. He had heard Pilate declare, I find no fault in him, John 19 verse four. He had marked his God-like bearing and his pity for feeding forgiveness of his tormentors. On the cross he sees many great religionists shoot out the tongue with scorn and ridicule the Lord Jesus. Notice, I'm going to interrupt again sure. for a second. Notice Ellen White calls them what? Religious. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't call them, doesn't call them Sandy, he doesn't call them priests, he doesn't right. call them Levites. <laughs> Religious. Yes. He sees the wagging heads. He hears the unbraiding speeches taken up by his companion in guilt. If thou art be, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Among the passers-by, he hears many define, defending Jesus. He hears them uh, repeat the words and tell of his of his works, the conviction comes back to him that this is Christ. Turning to his fellow criminal, he says, Does not thou, does not thou fear God? Seeing thou art the same condemnation, that dying thieves have no longer anything to fear from, from men, but upon the, upon the cause of him to, upon, upon the, then they, okay, upon them, but upon one of them presses uh, upon the, one of them presses the conviction that there is a God to fear, a future to cause him to tremble. And now all sin polluted as it is, his life history is about to close. And we indeed justly, he mourns, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. There is no... Here's, here's, let me interrupt God. again. Here's, here's the man who is attracted by Jesus, and then he's convinced by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, no, this man can't be, can't be what he claims to be. So he turns away from him, he falls into bad company, he gets, he gets caught, and so he's condemned to die. And now, all of a sudden, here in this situation, he says, I was wrong. I misjudged. Look at the, be look at the behavior of this man, look at the behavior of those people. Look, look, and, and, and the truth struck him. And I believe because of, the, because there were many people around the cross, because of his testimony, who knows how many people yeah. will be. There is no question now, there are no doubts, no reproaches. When con condemned for his crime, the thief had become helpless and despairing, but strange, tender thoughts now spring up. He calls to mind all he has heard of Jesus, how he had healed the sick and pardoned sin. He had heard the words of those who believed in Jesus and followed him weeping. He had seen and read the title above the Savior's head. 
He had heard the passers-by repeated, some with grieved, quivering lips, others with jesting and mockery. The Holy Spirit illuminates his mind, and little by little the chain of evidence is joined together. In Jesus, bruised, mocked, and hanging upon the tree, he sees the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Can I interrupt one more sure, time? Sure, sir. After all that situation, see, and heard all these phrases, he says, I can just imagine what was going on in his head. Yeah. How did he end up here? How could they possibly decide, have they decided to crucify him? I'm sure he, his, his mind must have been racing. Right. right. Oh, go ahead. <sighs> Hope. Hope. Hope is mingled with anguish in his voice as the helpless, dying soul casts himself upon a dying savior. <laughs> as the, as the, what am I, hope is mingled with the anguish in his voice, as the helpless, dying soul casts himself upon a dying savior. Lord, remember me, he cries, when thou comest in thy glory kingdom. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 470, 749, Paragraph 3. And imagine what he's going to say when he, he rises on resurrection morning mm -hmm. and there's Jesus coming in the clouds. Mm. Mm. It is clear that we live in a world that is hurting. Everyone on this earth needs to hear the truth about God and be attracted by the loveliness of Jesus. But how many of them recognize that? They may feel a heart longer for something beyond themselves, but they do not recognize what it is that they need. Seek God for a seeing eye, a listening, sensitive heart, and a willingness to share the Christ you know and love with others, and you will be on your way to an exciting journey of a lifetime. Life will take on a whole new meaning. You will have a sense of satisfaction and joy that you have never experienced before. Only those who work for souls can know the satisfaction it can bring. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, July 15. I, uh, I mentioned earlier about joining us that small church where it just seemed to explode. Well, one time, completely by accident, I was invited to a connection with that church. I was invited to a cocktail party. It was, it was put on by my lab instructor at school, and he wanted all the people in the lab to come. And I said, no, I don't drink alcohol. He said, no problem. You know, there'll be other things to drink. So my wife and I went, and lo and behold, there was someone at that party that said, you know, start asking questions and so forth. And that person ended up being a teacher in one of our universities. Mm. Adventist University, became an Adventist. A teacher here at Loma Linda, actually. Mm. Mm. So, wow. Well, Paul was no doubt the most outstanding evangelist in New Testament times. He was constantly looking for new places to witness. In fact, he didn't want to go where someone else had already started the work. He says, let me go to brand new places. And do you remember why he said he, he wanted to do that? It's so that I, 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 don't, I don't deserve to go where someone has led the way. I need to go to the toughest places of all. And he chose to, yes. Yeah, because I, I persecuted the church. Wow. He was persecuted. He was stoned and left for dead. Right. He was imprisoned, but he continued to witness. Jim? 2 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13. When I arrived in Troas to preach the good news about Christ, I found that the Lord had opened the way for the work there. But I was deeply worried because I could not find our brother Titus. So I said, Goodbye to the people there, and I went on to Macedonia. Well, so let's give a little bit of background here. Paul had already spent two years working in Europe, mostly in Corinth. And remember, he had been to Neapolis and then to Thessalonica and to Berea, and finally he chased out of there down to Athens and then finally over to Corinth. That's where he spent most of the time. And he did a lot of work there. And then he decided he needed to go back to Jerusalem, and he took an offering back there to help people out there. 
And then he, he, on the way, he passed through Ephesus, and the people there, apparently there must have been somebody there who, who knew something about Christianity, and they begged him to come back. He actually left... Um, I can't remember the, who, what was the couple's name that were his fellow workers in the... Aquila and Priscilla? Aquila and Priscilla, exactly. He left them there. They were traveling with him. And he said, please, you, you, you be, stay here and get things going in, in, in Ephesus and I'll be back. So he came back there and while he, he worked there in Ephesus for three years and during that time, hints started coming through the wires, well, not through the wires literally, but people traveled and said, Things aren't going very well back in Corinth where you, you started the work there. And Paul became very worried. I'm sure he was on his knees praying for those people. And without going into a lot of detail, there's evidence that he probably got on a boat because it was easy to take a boat from Ephesus to Corinth. He went back there and they despised him to his face. They just The church in Corinth. And Paul got on another boat, went back to Ephesus, what am I going to do now? Here I spent a year and a half working for those people, and now they're, they're about to throw the whole thing over. And finally he said, okay, he wrote a very, very strong letter. And he gave it to Titus, and he said, Titus, you need to go and, 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 and let those people know what a mistake they're making. And so now, this verse that we just read, he finally, it's, it's getting to be winter season. And, and the, weather, the weather in that part of the world, you don't travel in boats when the, when the big winds come down across Turkey and so forth. And so Paul decides to set out walking. It's probably several hundred, in fact it is, several hundred miles. He's going to walk that whole distance around to find out what, he, he just couldn't wait any longer to, to figure out what was going on there in the church at Corinth. And so he walked around and he got up here to, to Troas, and something interesting is going to happen there. In, in a very short, maybe a couple of sentences, what was the basic problem with the church? Was it that undedicated people who were influential, who had the money, they took control of the church? That's what I get. Well, yes, and if you look at 1 Corinthians, he, he letter, wrote his original letter to them, and they, remember, there's, they, at the beginning of each chapter, most of the chapters, there was, there was a man living with his stepmother. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There were people yeah. raising questions about the gifts of the Spirit. There were people going to court against other Christians. A whole bunch of crazy things. And, I mean, none of that should have been happening. And so Paul wrote this nice letter, and then things got worse. So that's the time he decided to go and try to do something. They despised him to his face. So finally he went back home and he wrote this very scorch, scorching letter and he gave it to Titus and sent him over there. And he just couldn't, he just said, man, I can't wait to find out what just happened. Just couldn't help it, but you look into the Old Testament, the Lord always wanted his peculiar people, yeah. always. Okay, so Paul had traveled back to Corinth, probably by ship, had been treated very badly by the people of Corinth. You can read about that in 2 Corinthians 2, 1 to 4. After returning to Ephesus, where he had been working, and after a lot of prayer, he sent Titus back to Corinth with a very strong letter to the people there. And scholars, looking at things very carefully, think that that letter might be mostly what we have in 2 Corinthians 10 through 13. Look at it sometime, and you'll see it's pretty strong language. He did not hear anything from Titus for a long time. He was so worried that he had decided to walk all the way around through Macedonia until he could find Titus and hear what had happened in Corinth and how they had responded to his letter. He wanted to know if they had repented. When he finally met Titus, who was on his way back to Ephesus, so Titus is coming this way and Paul is coming this way, and they finally met in Ephesus, uh, in, in um, where? I think in... Thessalonica, I'm not mistaken anyway. He finally met Titus, who was on his way back to Ephesus. He was delighted to get the good news that the Corinthians had repented and wanted him, Paul, to return to Corinth. By the way, that's one of the places where we know for sure what the word gospel means, because it says literally, Titus evangelized Paul. I did, not, not a question of Paul uh, bringing him the gospel, it's a question of him bringing him the good news. So evangelize means to, to bring good news. Another story in the few minutes we have left. 
Acts 8, 26 to 38, is the story of Philip. Now remember that when persecution hit Jerusalem, Philip among, was one of the former deacons that went down to Samaria. And he started a wonderful work there. And he had four daughters that were helping him, doing a great work. They were prophetesses. Mm -hmm. And surely God recognized the good he was doing there. However, God saw a specific opportunity that needed to be met. So he whisked Philip away, literally. One of the first airplane rides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> from Samaria and took him down, down to the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. There Philip saw an Ethiopian traveling in his carriage as he was returning from having worshipped in Jerusalem. And, yeah. Carrie, I think that's yours. Yes. An angel guided Philip to the one who was seeking for light and who was ready to receive the gospel. And today angels will guide the footsteps of those workers who will allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify their tongues and refine and ennoble their hearts. The angel sent to Philip could himself have done the work for the Ethiopian. But this is not God's way of working. It is his plan that men are to work for their fellow men. And that's from Acts of the Apostles, page 109, paragraph 2, by Mrs. White. Wow. I mean, we have, we have metal airplanes now that can carry us. But, I mean, surely God has that, has that ability to take us to the right people at the right time. I mean, think of this. God took Philip down there, exactly the right place, exactly the right person, was reading exactly the right passage in Scripture to provide such a marvelous opportunity to witness. And right there, an influence was set in motion that has impacted the country of Ethiopia from that day until this. Yeah. Just think about yeah. it. Amazing. Mm. Early in his ministry, Jesus had that opportunity as recorded in John 3 to witness to a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Yeah. With divinely inspired insight, he recognized what an important role Nicodemus would later play in the history of the Christian church. And of course, how, why was it that Nicodemus came in the, at night to see Jesus? He was a member of the Sanhedrin, wasn't he? Was, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And he was afraid of the... Repercussion. Yeah. Well, I mean, what happened, he heard Jesus. Yeah. And he recognized... This, this is no ordinary man. guy. Right. This is not any regular person. There's a reason why. So I have to, I have to know more. I can't, I can't just sit here. I've got to know more. I, I need to know more about this man, where he came from, how did he get all this ability and so forth. He was not scared. He was uh, perhaps even ashamed for people to know that he was coming and yeah. meeting with this man. Yeah. That's why he came at I mean, night. He was a member of the There you are, big boss. Right, he right. was a big man. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, Charles, I think you got... <laughs> yes, yeah, so with Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus had borne the expense of the burial of Jesus. The disciples had been afraid to show themselves openly as Christ's followers, but Nicodemus and Joseph had come boldly to their aid to help. The help of these rich and honored men was greatly needed in the hour of darkness. They had been able to do for their dead master what it would have been impossible for the poor disciples to do, and their wealth and influence had protected them in a great measure for the malice of priests and rulers. And I now, interrupt again. For sure. A I mean, look, here are two Pharisees from the Sanhedrin that did, came basically to Jesus' rescue and took him down from the cross and buried him in, in a rich man's grave. Yeah, they, they totally, when they came there, they aligned themselves, let everyone else know, hey, listen, this guy makes sense. Yeah, amazing. Okay. Amazing. Now when the Jews were trying to destroy the infant church, Nicodemus came forward in its defense, no longer cautious and questioning. He encouraged the faith of the disciples and used his wealth in helping to sustain the church at Jerusalem and in advancing the work of the gospel. Those who, in other days, had paid for his reverence, 
for he reverence. paid him reverence, now scorned and persecuted him. And he became a poor. He became poor in the world's goods, yet he faltered not in the defense of his faith. Ellen G. White, Acts of the Apostles, page 104, uh, verse, um, paragraph 2 to 105, paragraph 1. In the trust given to the first ap apostles, believers in every age have shared. Everyone who has received the gospel has been given sacred truth to impart to the world. How many people does that include? Everyone. Okay. God's faithful people have always been aggressive missionaries, consecrating their resources to the honor of His name and wisely using their talents in His service. It is a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of soul wound saving depends alone upon the ministry. So what does that mean? A uh, fatal mistake? mistake? That's deadly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. The humble, consecrated believers, believer upon whom the master of the vineyard places a burden of, for the souls is to be given encouragement by the men upon whom the Lord has laid larger responsibilities. Why is it that many more do not respond to the call? Is it because they think themselves excused in that they do not stand at the pulpit? Let them understand that there is a larger work, large work to be done outside the pulpit by thousands of consecrated lay members. Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, page 109, paragraph 2, paragraph 3 to 110, paragraph 3. So, how many are supposed to be working? All. All of us. Are we willing to be used by the Holy Spirit? Are we willing to work with God as a partner? I mean, we want to, wouldn't want to take on any lesser partners, right? <laughs> Why not pray this prayer? Lord, I am willing to be used for the advancement of your kingdom. Open my eyes so that I can see the providential opportunities you are opening before me each day. Teach me to be sensitive to the people around me. Help me to speak words of hope and encouragement and share your love and truth with those who come in contact with I come in contact with each day. If you will pray this prayer, God will do something extraordinary with your life. Winning souls is our responsibility. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what marvelous words we've heard today, thinking about all the opportunities that Jesus took advantage of and all that he did and those people like Paul who followed him. Could there be times today, in our day, when people like Paul, people like us, could turn the world upside down? May it be so, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.